Hello, I'm your host, Effie Pilarino, and today I have the pleasure to have uh, with me, with us, uh, Sophie Blackstad. She is the CEO of Hive Online, and uh, we'll be talking about the mission uh, of Hive Online and uh, also about a, a, a fresh recent report that uh, they just published around um, the next generation humanitarian distributed platform. So we will be focusing definitely on uh, humanitarian issues, financial inclusion, sustainability. So let me welcome you, Sophie, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you very much indeed for having me on, Effie. I feel very honored. So tell us uh, what is Hive Online, how and why did it come about and, and what are your activities? So Hive Online is a fintech startup, impact fintech startup, um, and we are using our experience in building international banks and in the humanitarian sector um, to help the people who um, cannot access or um, or, or find very very difficult to access banking services um, and to help communities for whom banking services may not be terribly relevant. Um, so we're focusing on um, communities in sub-Saharan Africa, mostly rural, um, many in the agricultural sector, and helping them to, to leverage their strong social bonds um, and the assets that they have, such as um, ar ar arable land and, and animals and crops and things, um, to to manage their cash flow, to raise capital, um, and to make their businesses more efficient through growth. Um, we use blockchain um, to to manage the the record keeping and, of course, um, moving money around when when we can. Um, and we also have a reputation that is based on data about commitments that the entrepreneurs make and when those commitments are met. Um, so there's a little bit of machine learning going on there as well. Um, and these assets mean that the farmers get identity, they get a wallet, um, and they get a reputation that they can use both to raise capital and to demonstrate that they're reliable to potential customers. So you are obviously taking advantage of the mobile penetration in Africa. Um, your technology, the wallets are uh, easily um, l created on um, uh, on a mobile phone. Yes, absolutely. So <clears throat> we work on a group basis, recognizing that many of the customers that we work with don't actually have access to mobile phones. Um, <clears throat> so within their groups, um, the authority figure, which can be a cooperative manager or a savings group secretary. Um, can set up profiles for all of them and each of those profiles has a wallet. Um, so yes, we're using mobile technology, but we're using it in a way that doesn't require everyone to have access to mobile technology. Um, <clears throat> acknowledging that although mobile money is penetrating these communities and is, is penetrating quite rapidly, um, there is still a, particularly in women, there is still a, a digital divide as well. Um, so we're, we're really leveraging the, the social bonds that these groups have um, and enabling them to, to join the digital economy, even if they don't actually have access to technology themselves. So can I imagine this as if uh, uh, we are in a village and there's um, one or five mobile phones and those are used to service, uh, to serve all the financial needs of, of all the people in, in the, the village? Um, to an extent, yes. We work with self-selecting groups. Um, so there are various types of social groups in African communities, which range from village savings groups, where women, usually mostly women, but some men, um, get together and agree on the rules that they will follow. And they're quite strict about rules. 
um, and appoint officers and membership is a very strict thing. And then each of these women is usually looking after between five and 15 people. So although the group is a, a selected group that has you know, agreed to certain conventions, um, <clears throat> yes, they are generally supporting the rest of the community as well. And then working with other types of groups like cooperatives, which obviously are a bit more formal um, and tend to have more, more members. Um, but again, there are certain formalities that those members have agreed to. So we're using both the bonds that those formalities create in terms of guarantees of certain types of behaviour, um, but also the commitment that these groups make to each other um, as cooperatives and as savings groups, um, which also means that their level of behaviour and their level of repayment of loans is usually um, better than if um, a financial institution is lending to an individual. Um, so yes, it can be the whole community, basically. Very interesting. So the, the governance structure is not something that you impose on them, you rather you use the technology and adapt their rules and, and the governance structure that makes sense. for Absolutely, these. yeah. Because I mean, without digital records, they're not able to leverage these great governance structures and strong social bonds that they have. But with the digital records, they can use that as a credit history proxy. And the other thing we do is we aggregate at a community level so that lenders can lend to the community um, as a commercial entity, um, other than having to lend to individuals. So again, we, we aggregate the risk, we reduce the overall exposure, um, <clears throat> and of course we enable them to, to um, access increased capital um, to, to do things at a community level as well as, as individual farmers or, or producers. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's basically using the things that they already have, um, the, the, the systems that they have developed for themselves um, and helping them to be more effective because of those, those processes and systems. Um, and, and the goal is to build better economies for um, communities who, who just don't have access to you know, our digital world and digital finance and all the things that we take for granted. Right. And, and most of the applications in these villages that you are empowering with your technology, what kind of currencies are they using? Are they using local currency? Are they using, you know, some other dollar currency or crypto? What, what are they using? But typically, the, the, the communities that we're working with are using their local fiat currency in, in, in cash. Um, <clears throat> we have built our platform around a stable coin. Um, which can be pegged to any fiat currency. So in Niger and West Africa, it's the West African franc. Um, so, you know, whatever, whatever they happen to use normally. And we're on the Stellar blockchain. Um, so we've got Stellar's atomic swaps and of course the trust lines, which means that we can manage um, when we get to that point. We haven't done this yet, but we can manage cross-border transactions as well. Um, but because our customers are mostly pretty illiterate, um, not very numer numerically literate, and not very technologically literate. <clears throat> we try and keep it looking as similar as possible to what they have been doing to date. <clears throat> so as far as they're concerned, it's just money. Um, and they put their money into a savings fund or cooperative fund or whatever, um, which from our perspective is effectively, it's a, a mini investment fund that we have built with certain rules using um, a token structure around the share system. And then we have a debt token as well. Um, but as far as they're concerned, it just looks like what they've been doing to date. Um, but it's more efficient, it's more effective. The sums are right, which are really important, it's really important to them. And it gives them access to, to the wider world of, of capital and markets. How, how challenging has it been to um, acquire customers if you want for your technology? Is it a pull or push situation? So we work with partners who are already working with these communities um, <clears throat> and for them it's a bit of a push situation um, but we found a lot of enthusiasm as people, um, you know, farmers in particular, understand the opportunities that it gives them. Um, so we, I wouldn't say it's going viral um, because we are leaning on our partners to distribute and educate people um, and in many cases it's, it's the first time they've used technology um, 
in some cases, it's the first time they've used um, something more sophisticated than WhatsApp. So there's, there's a bit of a learning curve and we, we work with partners to do that. <clears throat> so for example, in Mozambique, um, we're working with the Association of Modern Cooperatives, um, whose goal is to increase the professionalism of the cooperatives in Mozambique. Um, and we're also working with um, an NGO, uh, Nordhusfeld, um, which is a Norwegian NGO that has been working with the cashew industry in Mozambique for many years. Um, and again, sees the opportunity to professionalize the sector, sees the opportunity for um, intervention, which will increase the, the well-being and livelihood of these farmers um, who typically can't afford things like crop But care. also... Um, so there's, I mean, actually, I think the cashew sector in Mozambique is a really interesting one because um, in the 70s, it was the largest exporter of cashews in the world. And now it exports less than 3% of cashews globally. Um, and that's because, you know, they've had civil wars, they've had weather events, um, but mostly because they're all smallholder farmers who can't afford to plant new trees and, and manage crop care. Um, and given those opportunities, they are able to increase their yields, increase their, their livelihoods, um, you know, send the kids to school, etc. So it's a self-perpetuating virtuous cycle once you start injecting a bit of cash into these communities. How has it been uh, for you and for your, um, uh, the people that you serve, the villages during this COVID crisis where uh, presumably there's, they, they've been hit by the economic uh, uh, contraction, the global economic uh, contraction? How have you managed? What have you seen during this crisis? So we've seen a lot of um, negative impacts on the communities we're supporting. Um, although governments have been encouraging um, financial institutions to support them, um, there has been a bit of a credit crunch. Um, we've seen a depression in cashew prices um, by about 30%, which obviously has impacted these communities very hard um, in Mozambique. Um, we've also seen um, from a, a physical perspective that they are not able to meet in groups because there's a social distancing thing. Um, and actually one of the things the app does is it helps them to meet in smaller numbers of people and they still have the confidence that the meeting is being managed because anyone with a device can see the messages that are coming out. Um, I mean, yeah, financially it's been, been pretty bad, but um, the, the, the groups that we're supporting um, in many places are also hit by a double whammy because they're also in areas where there is conflict. Um, so for example, the farmers in Cabo Delgado in northern Mozambique, where there is an armed conflict, very nasty armed conflict going on between insurgents and, and government forces, um, you know, the financial industry moves out. So people who had very little access to financial services to start with, it's, you know, they've been hit first by COVID and also now by, by conflict. Um, and so actually these kind of solutions are, are more needed than they were previously. Um, and we're about to move into Nigeria, where in northern, northeastern Nigeria, there's a very similar situation, a lot of conflict, insurgency, and the financial institutions have moved out. Um, but they still want to work with these communities. So, you know, providing remote solutions like these has become more and more critical. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a really tough year for us because, um, you know, we, as, as an, as an organization, you know, we're not able to, um, to profit as much, but, um, it, it's, it's also been really exciting, um, seeing all of the opportunities to help Africa, um, digitize further. Um, and something that I've observed is that the, the appetite for financial, digital financial solutions has increased something like between three and five years ahead of where we expected it to be by this point in time. Um, are, you, so been... are you competing, so to speak, for the same clients as the, you know, M-Pesas uh, of, of all Africa and all the other digital offerings uh, that are being exported there? Or are you targeting a, a really underserved um, part of, of the population? So, so we are generally targeting populations who have not yet fully adopted mobile money solutions. Um, although M-Pesa is actually rolling out very rapidly in Mozambique, they have 5 million customers there already. 
um, and they are starting to target the areas that we're in um, and that's why we're in discussions with them about potential partnerships. Um, so what we offer is there are there are crossovers to what we do um, certainly moving value around lending etc um, but we also offer um, this community trust angle and some structured lending products which MPESA is not interested in doing and it's not really relevant to their core offering which obviously is is, um, is remittances and, trans and, uh, and transactions so um, it's it's a slightly um, tense discussion um, but we we both have um, complementary offerings which are interesting to each other um, and in general we're happy to partner with mobile money providers because our customers are often using them already um, and we believe in offering our customers more flexibility not less flexibility sure sure what about um, uh, universal basic income um, schemes that are being tested um, um, you know, all around the world, and uh, there's some early um, pilots um, that are uh, even in the stable coin space. Uh, I, I've been uh, doing a little bit of research in this area, and there's one that you might know, uh, Circles, that's using um, uh, the USDC stable coin, and then there's another one funded by Toro called the Good Dollar. And, and they are, um, so is that something that you're open to, to collaborate with those initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer in UBI. I you know my flag to the master there. Um, and we did talk to Good Dollar and the REC project in Barcelona as well um, about their different models. I, I actually thought the REC model was very elegant um, and that made it into the report. Um, but um, yeah, so short answer is yes, we do think it's something that's um, a very interesting economic solution. Um, I think it's getting more necessary with COVID again. Um, and what we've actually seen, as you know very well, is that um, there's been forms of UBI being distributed by governments not very efficiently um, in response to the COVID crisis. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it happening. Um, now, the, the advantage of doing it with a stable coin is obviously you've got the ability to distribute it without having to go through the financial system, without having to go through banks, which create a lot of friction um, so, and also create barriers to many of the people who are most in need. I mean, if you look at the US, for example, <clears throat> if you've got something like six or seven percent of people who do not have bank accounts, um, you know, you, you start distributing checks to people that that makes it very difficult for the people who are the most impacted um so yeah i, th I think this the ubi and stablecoin is a natural bedfellows what i also think though is i think some of the models we're seeing um with um non-stablecoin ubi models are a little bit more um dubious in terms of i'm not sure that in all cases the economics has been fully worked out um and sometimes there seems to be more emphasis on keeping communities keeping the currency in the community rather than necessarily giving people a stable and useful instrument that they can use to to manage their daily lives um so i think there's a lot of learning still to do and i, I think the studies that have been done are really interesting there is a lot of learning but clearly programmable money in whatever form allows for adjustments and learnings along the way and, and adapting the program um, by learning from, from you know, the use and the data. So let's talk about this new report. Why, um, why did you decide to uh, launch uh, and put together this uh, report focused on uh, a humanitarian distributed platform that I understand doesn't exist. You're sort of looking at what it would require. Mm -hmm. So um, as usual, this was actually um, a result of many conversations I've been having um, with Adam Bornstein at the Danish Red Cross, um, who's <clears throat> their head of financial innovation. Um, and he's been running a number of, of blockchain based projects, as many people in the humanitarian sector have been doing um, for, for a couple of years now, um, and recognized that there were some challenges associated with um, the projects that he's been doing. 
Um, and then in parallel, um, there's been, as, as you're probably aware, um, a collaboration of, N of NGOs, um, a loose collaboration, um, really led by Mercy Corps and Rick Shreves, um, to try and identify how the humanitarian sector can best leverage this technology. Um, and basically, Adam came to us and said, look, you know, you guys know about this stuff and we're in, you know, the impact sector and we have an interest in the, the next generation of distributed ledger technology, which can help, you know, businesses like mine, as well as humanitarian organisations. Um, so really, it was a bit of a meeting of minds of, you know, we all think this is something that's important to do. Um, and between the, those organisations, Hive Online and Mercy Corps and, and the Red Cross, um, it gave us access to a vast network of people who've been engaged in this sector um, with, with the technology. Um, so it meant that we were able to, um, to meet and interview a large, well, not a huge number, but, a, but most of the people who are running these kinds of projects. Um, and we were able to, to understand from the, the work that they've done and um, also talking to a lot of blockchain companies and other interested parties um, and academics and people, you know, what, what would a great blockchain or a great distributed ledger technology look like for this sector? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it came about because there has been um, for many years, I mean, Rick's, Rick set up a group first in 2017. Um, to look at this technology and how it could be used for the humanitarian sector. Um, <clears throat> but we, we all felt that really now the technology is growing up and, you know, or has grown up to, to a large extent. And the sector is, the humanitarian sector is, is more accepting than it was previously. And they've gone through the sort of, you know, the two or three years of experimenting and failing and finding things that worked and finding things that didn't work. Um, so it just seemed to be the right time to do this. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, we didn't come out with the perfect solution that's already on the market. Um, and the reason for that was, although there's many, many really great technology solutions, um, <clears throat> the, the combination of governance, business model, um, technology, um, and, uh, you know, un underpinning factors, um, such as, you know, what, what I call non-functional requirements, cost structures and things like that, just wasn't really 100% match for what the needs are. Um, but having said that, I think that there are there are many great solutions which could be used in, in the short term by the sector. Um, and really moving on from, you know, everyone's using Ethereum to um, actually here we've got some, you know, fast, high throughput, low cost um, DLT solutions, which may not even be blockchains, um, which, which can support the needs of these organizations. But at the end of the day, Sophie, isn't it um, clear that unless um, we tackle the um, uh, self-sovereign identity issue at scale, we're not really um, uh, unlocking the full value, the full potential of uh, using, as you said, the distributed ledger technology or a blockchain um, for this purpose? Yeah, and I think that, I mean, as, as we said in the report, self-sovereign identity is, is a goal um, to be aimed at using this technology. I think realistically, um, expecting to get there in a short period of time is, is not going to happen. Um, but there are components of self-sovereign identity which absolutely can be injected. Um, just like the identity we're creating in Mozambique for the farmers, it's about you know capturing certification that can then be used for identity and that may not be a fully fledged 100 percent 360 degree self-sovereign identity but it's a good start um, <clears throat> and we're seeing that with work like we're doing like bank U is has been doing for, for a number of years now um, and there is i think there is a a, a development there's a, there's a learning curve um, both for our customers who are generally not exposed to technology very much um, but more importantly for people like the financial institutions and governments um, where I think that they will need a volume of evidence before they will start accepting self-sovereign identity as a, as a normal thing and we're starting to see that happening I mean if, if you look at the work that um, that Keep has done in Sierra Leone which you know 
wow, they've created a national identity based on blockchain. And that's quite unusual. Um, but I mean, it, one of the things I love about Africa is that um, because there is so much opportunity, you know, you've got 66% of people without bank accounts, you've got very poor infrastructure. Um, and all of that means opportunity. And that often means that governments are quite willing to, um, you know, stick the neck out a bit. Um, you know, you saw Senegal was the first to issue its own central bank digital currency. Okay, that didn't really work, but you know, it happened. Um, so yeah, I, I, what I love about working in Africa is that, you know, you can have conversations with financial institutions and say, right, well, we've got these alternative identity points, you know, what do you think? And I say, actually, that's better than what we've got today. Because nowadays I have to ask my customer to draw a map of where he lives because nobody's got an address and nobody knows when their birthday is. Um, but you can give me data points which are different, but actually more valid than the data points I already have. Um, but yeah, to your point about self-sovereign identity, I think it's the way to go. But I think we also have to be accept that it will take time to evolve fully. And I think mistakes will be made along the way. Um, you know, it's it's a very it's a very risky field, basically. But I, I, I hear your point and, and it seems really the way to go where, as you said, if we are um, uh, not uh, obsessed with the perfect, uh, fully self-sovereign self identity, then we are able to launch these sort of digital identity versions that are much better than what we have and that sort of helps in uh, advancing and, and moving um, the field forward. And because as you said, governments and agencies and other entities um, see that this works and the buy-in is, is easier eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, having spent most of my career transforming banks, I'm a great believer in the boiled frog approach to technology that if you introduce something all at once it's it's scary it's a huge change um but if you introduce it piecemeal then people are much more accepting and you know within a few months they forget that they ever did anything differently um so it, it it's easier for the it's easier for customers it's easier for institutions it's it's just easier that way and yes it takes a little bit longer um, but I mean, again, having spent a long time building major technology and banking, so often you deliver this massive solution at the end of a two year project and it doesn't work right because, you know, the world has moved on in two years. Um, and with a sort of agile approach to identity, if you like, you, you can at least, you know, meet the needs that are today's needs you know as we as we went into mozambique we saw first thing what do they need they need to know that this person is the same person as this other person and they're in different systems and they're spelled differently and you know that's the basic need that's, that started and now we need to, you know to know what you know what crop forecasts they've got and, that, and then we need to know what quality and you know all of this it's this stuff is important to the people we're working with and you learn as you do and then the more you do the more your customers say, hang about, can we do this with it? And you say, actually, yeah, 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 you can. Um, and then what you're doing is instead of imposing solutions, it's actually a user-driven approach to building the solution in increments, um, which, you know, is to your point about adoption. You know, if, if you give people what they want, they adopt it. Excellent. Sophie, thank you so much for uh, sharing with us uh, uh, the, the amazing uh, mission and, and work that you're doing uh, in Africa. And uh, if you like, uh, tell us, uh, give us some uh, wishes that you have for Hive Online for next year. So, yeah, next year we're looking at um, a, a, a hugely increased workload. We've got um, projects coming up in Nigeria, as I mentioned, Zambia. Um, Kenya um, and, and various other countries. So um, we would love to meet um, financial institutions and um, you know, processes in the, the food chain, um, working with agricultural communities in Africa um, who would be interested in seeing how Hive Online can help your communities. 
um, and help you to access these communities and help them to be more successful. Um, so we're all about partnerships. We love working with partners. Um, we're doing that very successfully at the moment. And um, but you know, there's there's a lot more to do. And you know, Africa's a, a continent of you know 1.2 billion people, growing another billion people in the next 30 years. Um, there's a lot of people out there to reach. So we'd love some more partnerships. Thank you so much, Sophie. Well, thank you very much, Effie. It's been really great honour and great pleasure talking to you. Thank you.